So this is the uh, super critique, correct? Yes, and your trees are welcome. Either side of this static stage setup on the grass for the overflow, please bring them on up. Thank you. All right, All right let's get started. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Uh, we're having a lot of fun, and we hope you are, too. Um, so, how, how this afternoon is going to work. Um, who brought trees either for the super critique or, or the workshop? Raise your hand. Awesome. Did anyone bring trees for the workshop? specifically that they wanted, you know, some help, you know, shaping, looking at, or was it more just critique kind of base that you were kind of hoping for? Work. Work, work. 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 Okay. Work, work. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the, we'll, we'll do our super critique. Um, we'll go through and critique as much as we can, uh, especially trees that we think uh, have good value for the, the overall group. If we don't get to your tree that, that you brought, um, we'll, we'll do it in the, the super workshop. And, and how the super workshop works, we're going to do this for about an hour and a half, something like that. We'll take a break so you can go buy some trees from some vendors and some pots and all that. Um, uh, we'll come back after the break, and then if, if you need help choosing material from vendors, if you have a tree that you'd like to work on, uh, the, our panel will float around the room and help you. It's going to be more casual, fun. Um, we'll, we'll take down some chairs. We'll bring up some tables. Uh, so uh, it should be, should be great. Uh, Let's get started with our super critique. When we did the rendezvous a couple of years ago, this was by far the most popular thing from that event. And, and it told us as the club and, and us as presenters who are part of that, that there's a lot of value uh, in getting multiple perspectives at the same time. Uh, and with a super critique, it's great because it's not just us adding value, but you guys are going to see things too in the trees that we're looking at. And so we want to hear what you're seeing and what you're thinking about and all of those things. So we're going to kick off with this field-grown black pine. This is a Telperion black pine. Um, Tom Finsel brought it to sell. I believe maybe Jonas purchased it. Um, but what we'll do with, with other trees is we'll, if it's your tree, we'll, we'll have you come up, talk about the origin uh, and, and things like that. But let's get, let's get this uh, black pine going. I'm a deciduous guy, so I'm gonna hand this off to a, a conifer person. And uh, yeah. Jonas, let's see what you have to, to say about black pine. You bought this tree, so you saw something in it. I'm going to model good behavior yeah. in a super critique Please. by bringing a tree to the event and handing the microphone to an expert. Here's what, here's what you come to the super critiques for. What you want to know is, what is my future path? My imagination like anyone's imagination is limited to what we can find between our ears the reason we go to other people is to get perspective for feedback and for some ideas that we can evaluate and so when I find a new piece of material I always think where is the front going to be where is the future path and then it becomes a more fill in the blanks of how you're going to get to the end of the process so my question is where do you see the frame? Like if there's a triangle, if we're all doing asymmetrical triangles, there's a point, a left, and a right. I would love to know where those points are. At the most specific, I would want to know, where is my primary branch on the left and on the right? It's that simple. And I don't know that that's an easy question, Matt. <laughs> no, I know it's a loaded question like a lot of these have been we today. Have to but... Keep the microphone behind that. Yeah. So don't walk in front, don't hold the mic in front of the speaker. Okay, okay. We Good can, to know. We can see how it works. Then I don't, I don't get to block the tree either. So Good. people can, I gotta study it a little bit too, just to see what's going on here. I didn't, Jonas knows it a little better than I do, so. It's a nice, man, I'm just looking at it right off the bat, it's got a lot of branches close in and the first thing I noticed was this big this big stub right here which used to be a sacrificial something and got cut back pretty short probably with no intent for using it in the future so that was the first step and then now we're gonna have to to go back and make a cleaner cut closer to the trunk probably next time and try to make that angled and flat so when it heals it it can uh, callus over so that it blends it doesn't cause a reverse taper in the trunk it, you're trying to when you're do, doing those big wounds and wound healing you want that to to be part of the future taper and just not you know blend right in and give you good taper so that's going to take a wound that size you can see a pretty big chop that'll still take a number of years at least 
at least four or five years to start to start to close up it seems like probably more to completely close up and to disappear probably over a decade for sure but that's so kind of long term but that's the, the first obvious thing that sounds out stands out to me that'll that'll improve the trunk line is just getting rid of some of those wounds when you can so I wouldn't do that right now as the tree is growing uh, while it's still pushing these candles we're gonna go back and do some needle thinning and cut back and decandling Anytime starting now, depending on where you are, where the tree's at, where, what climate you're in, uh, I, I imagine Jonas would be probably doing at least that much if he has time when he gets it back home, because it's not, not a great time to repot them either when they're in the middle of growing, and so I'd probably hold off on that until next spring, but uh, this one should be, because it's already in a pretty shallow, relatively shallow container, we can assume that there's not too many problems going on down low, which is, which is nice, uh, sometimes you know, you know, they don't come like that, so... So I start by not only where the branches are, uh, when I try to decide my front, what the branches are doing, but uh, looking for the best trunk base and nabari, of course, root spread and flare and all that, and then movement within the trunk. Spin this one around a couple more times and see if I can even... Yeah, just based on, based on the overall branching and where the scars are going to end up being, a lot of them are that are there already on the back of the tree from this side. And I would call the back, and so I'm kind of I'm kind of leaning on on keeping keeping this as the front over here, just based on overall where the branches are coming out. You have this this one down low that has some good age already in thickness and is coming off to the side, so that's a good directional branch. You can see that one going off to the right, and then it gives you some good back branching for for depth and things like that. And then some of these that are coming right off the front of the trunk are just kind of eye pokers, so that'll probably, that'll probably go and that'll be an easy wound to heal. And then you always want to avoid any obvious visible bar branches on there too with any of the main branching. So I kind of go from there, so that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing. And then you get to the top of the tree and it has a good, good new transition and it has what I would call plenty of, you know, for a Telperian tree, plenty of good options to, to work to shorten this top even more in the future if you wanted to. So, oh, that's unfortunate right there. Okay, it's, it's done. She got it all. So I like, I like the way, you know, since it's a leaning trunk, that gives it good movement, and then it, the top comes back to give it good movement and taper. I also like how the, the roots on this side are really grasping the earth. It's really hanging on from that side, so even though it doesn't have much on the other side, I don't really, it doesn't bother me because of that. It's, it's got a powerful trunk, it's a powerful tree, so we want to end up with nice full pads with thick main branches, so some of these branches that are that are used, you know, it saves time to be able to use the older ones if they're, as long as there's not, you know, it's an old branch and there's, you don't have to go back and graft it, you know, even if you, sometimes it's worth using as a main branch if you know you can get a good graft on there and retain it that way. Otherwise, uh, this tree still has options that you could start over with if you wanted to. So having the options in good places is what I see on that tree and not, not too many major flaws either. So that's that's a good one. The, the first thing I see on this is, um, you have this really exaggerated, unusual base slash nabari on, on this side here. Um, and the best thing what, that you can do with a, a nabari or a base that's very asymmetrical, one-sided like this, is grow the tree the opposite direction because it gives it a stability kind of effect. And so I think it, it's a very obvious choice design-wise when you have this stabilizing feature over here to grow the tree pretty hard. Um, to the, in this case, if this was our front, it would be to the left. So I think that's a, a real fun starting point. Great. Um, as uh, just jumping off what these guys are saying, I agree with what they're saying. Um, I think that there's still some uh, thinking that could be done regarding taper. On this tree so maybe uh, some kind of a sacrifice off of here even uh, below the crown could even even be a possibility uh, to thicken up this area here because we're transitioning from about a five inch trunk to a one and a half inch uh, so that that might be something to think about also uh, eventual height uh, is a consideration 
And for this tree, this is a fast taper tree. Uh, it's got a really, really big base uh, tapering up, unless you're gonna take 20 years to thicken this up. We have a fairly short squat tree in the future. So not much higher than it is. So once you have that idea, you can start figuring out, okay, how, how far out is the branch that Matt identified, this one or one that, that you can replace it with, maybe even this one. It's a little, little bit easier to work with. It might have better taper in the future, but either one of those might create your key branch, and your key branch is probably going to come out a ways because of this thick trunk. If th this trunk were that thick, you'd want that branch really close in. Likewise, you probably want some branching that goes out quite quite a ways on the opposite side. So there's your there's your triangle. It's going to be somewhere somewhere in there, maybe a little bit lower. This could be a pretty squat tree, I think. Oh, and about the the lower branches there, like you got some since you have options, like one could choose to to use to have the the flow branch go back in the over the base of the tree, like Michael was saying, but using that as the main branch because. If you're bringing the top back over in that direction, but if you're creating movement and taper in that top, you could still have it going with the the flow to the the left there. I think from you guys who are seeing it. So I think you you know if you wanted some, uh, it just depends on what design option. Do you see that as being a use it one side or the other? You like the 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 initial? I was, that is the apex finish left. I was I was thinking if you wanted to, you could I mean. You could treat that, that branch on this the right side as your main one of those you could go with in that direction if you wanted to to grow something out in that way as the main branch would be another way to do it and have the left side more compact. So that's something I didn't didn't think about at first, but I, I still like the kinda like the flow with the first option and keeping the, the other side more compact kinda seems to make sense. So that's just Is anyone in the audience see anything? Uh, planning angle changes. Anything there? Two by four underneath the downside? Uh, no. I think it's just about right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I think it's just about right there. It gives it. You could lean it more and kind of, kind of make I don't know, make the branching a little more. You have to fight, fight things into place a little more. But yeah, I think it has plenty of a lean and then. Uh, tilting it the other way would just straighten it out more, so that wouldn't make sense. I, I like it. My question for all of you is when you have a tree like this, do you have any ideas, or do you have good criteria for knowing which branches to cut around the bottom? There are around eight or nine branches ringing around the bottom. Is it obvious which ones are those to cut? If it is, we'll move on to the next tree. If it's not, I'll be curious what kind of criteria you might set for yourself so you'd know how do you take this next step because this is a very simple tree but to make something that we may find beautiful is a little bit complicated there's only so many branches you can almost roll a die and figure out well cut that one there's several more do any of you have any yeah steve obviously something coming straight at you like uh, you mentioned some high pokers that would also expose more of the more of the trunk that's right. So when you're hiding one of the main features of the tree, which would be that heart of the trunk, anything blocking that's going to come off. And I totally agree with that. And that's what Michael was kind of pointing us toward, is maybe losing those branches right in the front. What about around the back when you've got a ring of six other branches around the side, all emerging at the exact same spot? <laughs> Very common for pines. Let's see which one has the most developed usable ramification. Which one has the best ramification? You know, Great that criteria. Close or are they all out of tip? Right. Is all the green way out on the end or is there greening close? That's a huge criteria. Another one would be do you have the flexibility in that branch to get it where you need it to go? Well, there's one already angling down, giving it more age. That's right. One might already be at the proper angle and might already be coming down, and so that would be another obvious criteria. We need to base it off of the potential ones higher up that we would decide that we were going to use also. Because yes. otherwise, we have the bottom and then go up. That's exactly right. And so one of the criteria is where do we need to fill in foliage? 
if there's another branch right above it, we might be a, it might be a less expensive cut, meaning if we cut a lower branch, we can bend one down to fill that gap from above. I often think of any species I'm working with, what does it look like from above? Do we have a nice radial spread of, if not branches, then at least foliage that can cover the entirety to have a nice full canopy if that's what you're going for? So yeah, I think that's a huge criteria. Got a point I want to make behind you here, Jones. <laughs> Sorry. In terms of the uh, the eye poker, um, a good rule to keep in mind. But rules often have a position on the tree uh, where they are most effectively uh, <laughs> used. On the bottom two thirds of the tree, the eye poker rule is a pretty good one. On the top third, it's a pretty bad rule because we want to fill the, the in. The, the top third, the, the beginning of the crown of the tree, and some of those branches can come right at us. That is okay. Any other questions about what you would do with, with a tree like this? And the reason that's relevant is I assume tomorrow there's going to be a door prize, is that correct? Yeah, your demo tree. Apparently there's going to be a demo tree tomorrow that anyone who is registered for the event has a chance to win tomorrow. And so the more practice you have figuring out where we're going with these trees, because it will be a Telperian black pine, now's your chance to ask away, because this might be... Yeah, black pines are in the minority for the rest of our talk this afternoon. So any other questions about where we would go with this guy? Yeah, the, specifically with Telperian uh, pines that have, you know, this stuff this big, um, what's the plan for closing these woods? And does it, do we do that after, before something? Like, give us an idea of where the story right. I kind of touched on that a little bit, and a good, you know, like to follow up on it. So, with stuff that large, is still, like I said, like, I've done, I've taken at the right, like, I wouldn't want to do it right now while it's growing because a lot of sap is going to be bleeding all over the place. You don't, you do have to think about things like if it has good bark, and you make a cut, you know, that sap could ooze all over the trunk. So. I think you could do it though when you decandle the tree, when you slow it down or after that, and it'll give it more time to heal throughout the summer and going into the fall. And something that big you want to get started as soon as possible. So uh, that, that I don't I don't get really scared by the size of a, a wound that much anymore. You can't you can't do them at once. So if you have something that big right next to each other, we try to just do one at a time. But I'll do I'll do the I'll do one at the at one time the whole thing you know cut it down flat. Make the the edges real clean, and you know, go over them so they're they heal well. And you can use uh, there's different types of cut paste that'll encourage the healing process. The goo that we use kind of has some kind of hormone in there that supposedly speeds callusing up. And then uh, just using the dry putty, I've, I've seen them heal heal pretty well. And that's just something that you have to you have to get that wound down enough so it can heal over well in the future is the is really important. Yes, Dave, David. Yeah, please keep repeating them. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, how to how to treat the you know a wound? You see some of those uh, stubs on there are really huge. So how how long do those take to heal? And you know are they a problem? And yes and no. <laughs> and and another consideration is you don't have to heal them at all. That could be carved and become interesting deadwood. Uh, and that the might be because it's so large on this tree that might even be a better option. I think I think on this tree I disagree. I would want to. I think for the taper's sake, it is a tree about nice taper and. I think because I know something like that will heal in good time and doing it correctly, uh, doing it in stages or however you want, you don't do all the big wounds, like I said, next to each other, they can combine into one giant wound, which is something you want to try to avoid too much for the tree to heal out of maybe, but uh, it's just going to take some time. I think, I think uh, there are rare cases when deadwood works on a black pine, but because it's a black pine, they have softer wood. Obviously, it's not going to last as long as others that have harder wood. Please, please go, uh, Mr. DeGro. Yeah. Um, so my question would be, uh, we've, uh, we've been discussing branch placement on the tree, branch location, but what about mm -hmm. determining the ultimate size of the tree? <laughs> yeah, Michael uh, kind of was touching on that. Yeah. Right now, I'm looking at a 50-50 split in length uh, between the uh, lower trunk and the upper part. Um, and not everybody might find that 50-50 split to be satisfying well, in terms of proportion. So okay. before part of that, let me let me let me yeah. cut in front of you again. Part of that is like Michael was saying, like the upper part of the trunk still needs to be developed and thickened more because it's so dramatic right now. It's <laughs> out of proportion, right? Be based on the height. I'm thinking also possibly length. Length. 
Height or length? Height. Well, height or length. Uh, so my point is that there's uh, the the length of the bottom part yeah. of the tree and the length of the top part of the tree seem to be the same from here. Length of the and the branches you're talking about on the tree? Yeah, the first yeah. section of the trunk from here to here is the oh. same length as from there to the top. And well, you're talking about the taper still. So. Well, not taper. I'm not Total talking size. about diameter. I'm talking about length. It's the ratio of the first section to the overall height. That's correct. And it's very awkward to have the first section be at 50%. Right now it is. You'd expect that yeah. would come down a little bit or yeah. grow the whole thing up. Yeah. I still see it being a shorter tree ended up in here somewhere, but this part needs to be thickened up dramatically before it looks sure. more in proportion. Like, that's why it looks so, what you point out is, is how it looks, right? You're basing it how it looks right now. So once all these things happen, it will be aesthetically pleasing once, once things catch up. Once those scars heal, that'll give nicer taper because you're cutting those at an angle, so you're taking a lot of that meat away. So that's going to reduce that lower part of the trunk dramatically, just taking those, those wounds back. So ask Dave, do you want to make the tree bigger or smaller? That's a choice. If those are your two <laughs> options, what do you think? Do you have good criteria well, for why you'd want I, I to go up or down? I can't see it as well uh, from, from here or whatever. My, I think my choice would be because the lower part of the trunk is so massive, I would, I would lean toward uh, probably having 60% on the top instead of on the bottom. That would be my personal choice. It takes so long. I know. <laughs> but, but it's easier to make a better time, tree right? that way. Could, I think either either it, way. It could be it could be it could be forty percent on top. You know. Yeah, these percentages are just confused. I don't think in terms of I don't think in these terms that's all balance is balance, but no taper, all these things factor into it that we're talking about. So whether you end up with a slightly taller tree, a longer, whatever you want to call it, like it's gonna I think be in balance once these things happen and I, I see more of the interest being down low, which is why I want to keep it shorter, because that's more, it's a powerful tree, so I want your attention to be not, not carrying on too far in any, you know, from the top of the tree or the lowest branch, not going off out of space, and drawing your eye further and further away from the good parts of it. I have a question right there. What's that? Yes. For you, Matt. Um, what consideration would you give, you said you wouldn't tackle both of those wounds at the same time, Mr. Probably start with the biggest one that's going to take the longest time, as long as you can safely do that. And yeah, that this one I was pointing at, coming off to the side, would be the one I start with. And you said you're going to do a flush cut on that. I have done flush cuts on stuff that size. Yeah, at do you, once. Do you concave it in right at the slightly, edge? slightly. Right yeah, at the edge? I try to get it slightly concave, and then okay. it, as it, if it calluses over the way we want it to, it won't be bulging too much when okay. it does. Falls in. Or you can leave a. Sometimes we'll leave a, a higher point in the center. Okay. A little bit of old wood. You know, you chew, kind of make it slightly concave, and then it rolls, in, and then it kind of builds up. Give it something to build up around. Sometimes you can't make it too concave. It might kind of not build up as much. That callus won't, I guess. Okay, more questions. Yes. Would you ever reapply bark? Reapply bark to a wound? Uh, I like to do it the traditional way, just not try to cover it up. Uh, the only reason we might consider doing that would be for a show, just to, and it has to be pretty an unobvious spot. Like it can't be a fresh wound that you're trying to cover all up with bark. But pretty minor stuff, I think, is acceptable here and there. Would there be any specific uh, adhesive or? Oh uh, man, I've any glue? Any glue? Any glue? <laughs> I've used cut, I've used the the goo cut paste before. I think to stick it on. I've used its own sap before, probably to stick it on. <laughs> but I don't do much. I try not to do much of that. I try not to rely on that. Just try to try to learn how to heal wounds and get them get them nibbled down enough to where they can heal properly. And any other questions? Anybody else want to answer? Okay. Assuming uh, you did want to compact the design and emphasize the power of the tree as just much as keep possible. the height somewhere in here basically yeah there yeah. or lower would you achieve that do you think um, by using the existing structure and wiring it down and compacting it that way Both. or would you cut it back well I mean the advantage of using the sacrifice branches is you can keep those going and still train the other branches down low that are good usable you want to try to save time by not letting them get out of hand. So doing some of that selection we're talking about is what you can do, as well as you know, if we're gonna, if we want to make it a taller tree or just thicken this up, we got to leave 
this stronger and do some things to speed that thickening up and the scar healing. You know, doing both of those will will speed up both the help the wound heal and give you the the better taper. Next tree. Put that down. Next tree. Next tree. They let me pick, and I'm deciduous, so we're, <laughs> we're going to do a Japanese maple. Um, yeah, this is a Brandon Myrens. Brandon, tell us about tell us about your tree. Uh, well, I got this. I just happened to be in the right place, right time. <laughs> uh, I think I've had a tree, uh, this will probably be the third year, third summer. Um, it's pretty good, got good taper, working on brand selection this year, probably do a little bit of uh, So uh, this is Brandon Myron's tree. It's a Telperion Farms Japanese maple. Um, like a lot of Telperion Farms maples, uh, this was probably started as an air layer and grown over a geodisc. And because of that, we have a really nice base on this Japanese maple and a pretty, pretty nice set of taper. Um, the one thing that I, I, I really see on this is, uh, you know, the trunk is so impressive that I think we can put some of that you know, meat into some of the uh, primary branching yet. I think it has a good start, and there's even like a really nice, unusual thick one kind of high, which traditionally um, might be kind of funky, but I kind of like that the trunk line fractures part way up. It's a very natural uh, thing, especially on Japanese maples, which tend to be multi stem plants. Um, but something I found really useful when you have a field grown deciduous trunk is in another month or two, once this first flush of leaves hardens off. Um, thin out every single branch that you don't like, which is probably on, you know, a young tree like this, probably going to be about 50% of the, 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 the branching or the twigs off. Stuff that popped, you know, where you don't need it. Uh, and then let the rest of it run for probably till fall. And this tree might, you know, touch the top of this tent, and that's totally okay because you're building structure and you're building that transition material from this really nice impressive trunk that Telperion grew. To, to get a little bit more structure into the branches. So I've been treating a lot of my Telperion maples in that similar manner, um, really letting them uh, really kind of blow out and, and run uh, to build that secondary kind of primary structure. I'll, I'll pass this off to someone else. Michael, you do a lot of maples. I As I was passing, Matt said, you probably didn't hear that. I agree with all that. It works well. It works well, he says. <laughs> doing the selection and having multiple sacrifices. Like it's just... yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this does have a nice nabari. I haven't had a chance to look at this tree yet. Um, to Andrew's point, we have a lot of branches here. I don't know if you can see that. I can only see it looking up into it that are all the same diameter. So this is where... A little bit of selectivity about which ones you let extend. Maybe you, maybe you let them all extend for a bit, and after they harden off, you cut off the ones that you want to keep a little thinner. Because as the year advances, it's going to keep building wood, and you keep the lower ones. That's you know one idea. So this has a really interesting little snuffleupagus kind of looking trunk. That's a little sub trunk right here. That's a branch that's rising, doing a, a very deciduousy thing, which is creating multiple. Uh, apices uh, or multiple trunk lines that create multiple canopies. I used to use the word apex, which I think is a very inappropriate bonsai word because it, it represents kind of a pointy thing. <laughs> but a canopy, at least in, in Japan, they call it the canopy the atama, um, and that means head. Uh, so your crown, you know, you can think of it that way. Um, but that's what I would say about this tree. Yeah, I agree with all that. Anybody else say something? Yeah, we're good. Next. Another maple? Let's it up. What was that? Um, All right, this is an Atlas Cedar. Um, 
Kim, I'll let you tell the story, but the fun thing about this is this was a workshop with Dave DeGroote from the BSOP Rendezvous a few Woo! years ago. So it's fun to see trees right. return. I was drunk when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. And Dave can tell us where it, this was field grown somewhere. You don't know? I was told it was field grown somewhere. Uh, Bonsai John, Northwest. Bonsai Northwest. Northwest, okay. And um, when I got in the workshop, I just slayed like a whole bunch of it. And it came out of the workshop with like one, two, uh, like seven branches sticking out with nothing on them. So um, it does actually have, that's actually the angle right there. Um, I brought it because we need to work on some of these. We need to do something with these right here, which is why I brought for the critique was to be able to hear about how to how to strangle those off or whatever. And um, I've had a really good time. I took it to uh, Ryan's uh, class in October, somewhere in there, wired it out. So it's been having fun ever since. <laughs> What are your primary questions about it that you have for us today? Um, we want to be able to, I think, uh, so it's like, uh -huh. that's the angle on it. We'll probably bury some of this, but we need to do some root work with it. And, and... Awesome. So cedars have two of my favorite characteristics. When you take the wire off, the branches bounce back to where they start. Yes. And if you... <laughs> yeah. And if you bend too far with no warning, they snap off. So, they're fantastic species to work with, especially when the branches get meaty. There was a classic demo, gosh, 20 years ago. I won't say who it was. And it was a Cascade uh, Cedar demo. And after dutifully raffing up the whole thing and wiring it, came time for the big... And the whole tree came off in his hand. After which followed a wonderful lecture on what you might have been able to do with a tree had it been connected to the roots. So, really fun species, Kim, thanks. So I'm grateful that we already have the natural movement in it. The branch development happens very naturally. Even if you don't know what you're doing, if you know where you want the silhouette to be, you can kind of cut where you need to as long as there are tufts of new needles coming out. You get the development really quickly and you just get a lot of practice wiring. And so the top part's more of a stylistic exercise and a patience exercise. As for the roots, you will find that since this is the new angle, you kind of have roots above or a bulge above where you want roots and roots below where you want the roots. There's no easy way to fix that. So you think, well, what are our next steps? If your soil will be up at this level, you might not see roots on that side because your only other option would be to lower the soil so low on the left side of the tree that then those roots are floating. How much root do you want to see in that area on this tree? Because we either expose lots of roots on both sides or we start putting soil in there and then Before over time we hope roots start it, filling it was, up. It was, this is where the soil line was. And so is there a trick other than building up soil here and letting roots grow into that area over time, which we wouldn't expect to ever form Nabari-like structure, but when we've got a big gap to close, I would moss it so that we have a beautiful taper from the base of the trunk into a graceful transition into the ground. But otherwise, if our new soil level is here, we'd be exposing a lot of roots. And so some people love seeing the spaghetti roots around the surface, and I say, great, we lower the roots on the other side. But yeah, they kind of do the exact opposite of what you want. And so that's my first guess. Did you have another option for what we might go? I was trying to get a yeah. tourniquet I have not seen that work with this species, so I don't know if any kind of tourniquet approach or anything fun would work. I also don't know if this is an obvious candidate for ground layering because you have so many individual stringy roots down there. That is not what would make me think, let's experiment with this one. I think some of like some of some of these can probably be removed. Lots of those can be removed. Yep. When you repot it, depending on, you got to find out what it's doing, where it's going, where it's coming from. Oh, I was just just trying to get a close up look at this this root, kind of a little bit of a mess, tangled mess here, and some of the some of these like if they have good like if they have character or they're not crossing or they have some age already like sometimes that can be a plus even if you want to change the angle and bury them a little bit. But, uh, 
something like this on the surface, even though it wraps around from the back and uh, it still kind of adds some char some natural character in my, my opinion, rather than something like that. Uh, you can only do so much just to cut them all off, and if you do girdle them and try to weaken them, that can just take a long time anyway. But some of these, I think, the obvious ones, you can start by taking some of these off probably pretty safely. Some of these that wrap around the outside that aren't so visually attractive, and then I'd probably, yeah, think about the angle, and as a part of that, in the root work, I'd be trying to eliminate some of those just to to help it out a little bit that way. That could be done pretty safely. There's more roots coming off of the tree all from other places. It's not like you only have these roots sustaining the whole tree. So uh, It's got a pretty nice, pretty interesting base, though. I mean, with all of those comprised like they are, even if you buried some of it, that would help. That would still help it out by, by, by setting these down more. Even I don't mind seeing a little bit serpentine-like surface roots wrapping around, and especially when they get bark and age on them. So that could turn into a plus, I think. Can you uh, pinch the cedar? And if it can be pinched, what, what's a good time to pinch them? Does anyone pinch cedars? No. I've always found pruning gets the results okay. yeah. you need on So those. let it grow and then harden and then go back and prune it. Yeah, you tend to get these nodes where the needles come out and those tend to not disappear. Mm -hmm. And so it's only when you get in the long shoot. Um, the closest thing to pinching would be more of a scissor pinch when they're escaping the silhouette you want. And even that would be years from now once it's filled in quite a bit more than it is now. And what's great is when cedars are mature, they're actually very easy to maintain the silhouette. The hard thing is just to keep the branches where you want them. Yeah. Yeah. Also in terms of just basic horticulture for, for true cedars is that they will fill up a pot at twice the rate of yes. a pine. Uh, I found that even if you got a large pot and a large tree, they need to be potted every two years. If you go to three, four years, you can end up with a lot of water penetration issues. I don't actually worry about the scars. There's enough deadwood gins along the length of the trunk that at no point does it really stand out like those are all fine, but that one's weird. Yeah. It's just kind of the character of the tree. And that's common in a lot of our field grown cedars that we have. Uh, some of them, I see people leave the gins all the way up and down. Some people try to heal them all over. and it, does disappear mostly, but that's after many, many years. You can still see the little circles because there will be a crease where the bark's forming around it. How about this front? Where, where was everybody looking at this? This. It's high. Like that. Really wide base, and then you tip it that way. There's like a hole to it. Right. Yeah. This is an alternate front. Yeah. You can put your box back in there. I don't think it quite, quite fits. Canopy over the over the base, wide base, not quite as far a, tw a, a tip, so hopefully the octopus roots don't start swimming away. <laughs> and, it is, yeah. and at a smaller angle, it's a lot easier to keep a lot more of the root. So it sounds like regardless of the angle, you can clean up some of the worst offenders and just leave it be a little bit messy on the top and that way you can preserve the most roots all the way around which gives you the most character right at the soil line. Any other cedar questions? I got one. Yeah. Uh, other questions. So, I mean, I actually kind of like the way the roots look. Uh -huh. um, she just left it like that for like another decade or two. I mean, they'd bark up and fuse together, wouldn't they? They would. What sometimes can make the tree look even more powerful is when we downplay some of the gaps between those roots. And so when we have roots that are completely disassociated, it might help us get a more balanced look at the base of the trunk to either remove or hide some of those or to fill in with soil some of those bigger gaps. So we're still preserving as much of that character as possible and letting it age and bark up while trying to just make sure it gives us the most attractive presentation at the base. I've got a quick question about this before it goes away, um, yes. and we can talk about it maybe just. But what do you do about branch uh, angle? I think this is a great example of branch angle, because almost any way you tip it, you've got something pointing almost straight up at the bottom. <laughs> and a lot of trees that are field grown have this issue, so. Well, I can tell you how people have answered that in the past, is it's a very common branch pattern on cedar where a lot of the branches go like this. They kind of angle up and then go out because if your option is cutting that whole branch or leaving something at an awkward angle, 
that's usually what happens. When that happens, it's best if it's say a key branch that is unique, ideally lower on the tree with a heavier branch. It looks weird sometimes when you have one upward angle branch in the middle of the tree. There's Unless it's kind of in the back and you can you don't see it as well. I think, uh, if we were to keep the front the same, then there's ways around, there's ways to improve the balance, even though these are fairly brittle trees, you can still fix the balance by dropping, you can still hide some stuff that maybe has, doesn't have, the one angle coming off of this side, there probably wasn't much you could do to begin with to get that down, it made more sense for it to come up rather than being level off the trunk, so it's still better than level, thick branch, and the, the rest of these can still be lowered a little bit, you test the flexibility, they still have some. If you need a raffia some, that'll still help if you really need to get it down a little bit more. And we all know these just, you have to be really careful how far you push them when you're bending them. So the balance can be improved either way, either front. Dave has a story. Bending down that tree at the Pacific Museum, the uh, punching holes underneath or cutting it, and then bending it down, creating new wood so that it holds itself rather than springs up. Do you remember Masi Mizumi? His, yeah. his trick was drilling a hole halfway through the trunk and turning an upright tree into a cascade. <laughs> he did so many they called it moss production the way he did it. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone in the Bay Area knows now that there's a lot of those trees here. All right, whose juniper is this? Is Andrew, yes. Did you possibly put that box up there, that tote, on top of the turntable, so that you can raise that tree. Yeah. Yes. Let's do that. Thank you. Or I can just hold it. <laughs> Jonas is our model for today. <laughs> uh, whose tree is this? Two. Sam, over here. Over here. No, 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 just, just put the box on. Oh, oh. Uh, no, 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 the center doesn't bear weight. But... All right. We're all figuring it out together. All right. Um, yeah, whose juniper is this? All right. Sam, tell us about it. All right, here, and I'm going to give you the mic, too, just so our, our viewers online can, can listen in. Well, I, I got this uh, from Tom. He brought it home from Pelperian after the fire. I just took it home and stuck it in a pot, and uh, I liked it because it kind of looks like a dinosaur or something. <laughs> um, I just, I'm going to slowly lower it a little bit more in the pot, and I need to tilt it a little bit, but I just, I just wanted to get it right into a pot and, and start getting some training on it, teach it to be in control. What are your questions for the panel? I don't know. Uh, what would you um, leave? And... Would you uh, go more up here on it and, and expose more of the trunk and try to make it into a semi cascade? They're investigating. This is alive right here. This is gone. This is gone. This is alive, alive. You've stumped us. No, no, no. First thing. First thing, I mean, when something is this unobvious, like, well, we got, it's a young tree and it's a juniper with no deadwood yet or hardly any, so that's one thing we can always do is add some deadwood and we got some, some straight sections in here, some straightness in the trunks. Uh, those are a little harder to bend at this point uh, for the most part, and a lot of them are just too leggy and thick still, so they can still be worked back in, if not heavily manipulated in the future to add better movement, which some of them, there's still techniques to allow that on a young juniper, raffia, hollowing, and things like that, uh, worth it on a tree like this to improve it. But uh, just for this, from some of these straight sections that are already kind of thick and straight that kind of hug the surface and it's interesting how all the, it's kind of a raft, semi-cascade raft style thing, which is kind of interesting, definitely unique. Uh, at least putting some shari on these main trunks, especially this thick one that's, that's you know, really part of the, has roots coming off all over the place. I like, I like that about it, how it's kind of a raft style tree. 
Uh, so I think there's a lot, a lot of interest that can be added just doing some initial bending and cutback and uh, shari and deadwood creation. I like this, this front that Matt is looking at. Sorry, Matt, jumping in here. Over here. Jonas, would you turn that toward the... Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that side uh, that's starting to face the viewers right now, um, that, it, as you said, a raft, it almost looks kind of nurse loggy to me, the way the roots are coming off of it. So some kind of hybrid of that idea, which isn't really, I mean, we don't see junipers growing off of nurse logs, but, you know, this is where you can... Uh, um, Get your imagination going. <laughs> I mean, just going with that, you'd have to, have to tilt Yes, it exactly. Yeah. Because that, <laughs> yeah, the, the one that's closest to you, that main trunk, is, is leaning back a bit. So, absolutely, yeah, it needs to come up. Yeah, there you go. Nice box. Machek has a question. There's going to be pads throughout and when all is yeah, said and done. Yeah, I see it as a much tighter tree around that sculpture. Absolutely, much yeah. more compact is the, the goal, yeah, overall. Just showing off, just trying to hide the things we don't want to see. Just break, you know. Uh, what was the question? Oh, oh, the question. Well, one more time, could you say that? Uh, it, it reminds me of a, a, a tree that, uh, that Michael, Michael's been working on for a couple of years, a yellow cedar. Michael's been working on a yellow cedar for a couple of years. Reminds him of this this type of like a, a sculpture of wood formation. Pads, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We definitely want to try to try to create more and then bring it, expose it by by having tighter, shorter pads closer in with enough separation to to allow your eye to to see those. We got to make those interest. We got to make that stuff more interesting first. Is is all I would do to to start with on this though to to get it there. And there there's some areas that you're going to be cutting back and. Try to try to get more light into the interior so the wheat the wheat growth that we want to retain for the future stays strong or gets stronger, and then we can kind of like some of the black pine, we can redo a lot of branches if, just to kind of almost start over if we have the the good options close in. And then this one does. Oh, that's anybody else? Any any questions? Yes, yes, sir. This looks like a kishu, yeah. Or, no, not Nitoigawa, they're a little tighter and finer. This is a Kishu variety, I would guess. Yes. Yes. Sam, did you make this cut? Yeah, okay. but don't look at the bottom. I won't. Too late. <laughs> Too late. For anybody who gets the great chance to come up here and use the microphone, I want you to feel very comfortable with it. Notice how close I am to it. My voice isn't this beautiful, but this town system and these five fellas sound fantastic on it. I, I promise their voices are not actually this good, but <laughs> feel comfortable. Don't, it's right into your face. Thank you for that read. I love you all. all right. <laughs> well, they let me pick, so you know what I picked again. Um, Jonas has a really fun horn beam that he's been playing with for years, so I'm going to defer to him initially. But Korean, uh, who's, who's is this? All right, Mike. Can you uh, can you come tell us about it? Okay, it's a Korean horn beam I got from Southern Waterworks. I got it like five years ago. Had it in a wooden box for a couple years, and then put it in the Anderson flat. Um, and I brought it here just to, I needed to develop a canopy and get some ideas and. Uh, figure out about the lower branches. Yeah. Cool. All right, Jonas, kick us off. How big a tree do you want to make of it? I, <laughs> I wasn't thinking much bigger than it is, but I'm open for ideas. <laughs> gotcha. I'm glad you didn't say you wanted a really short tree. No. <laughs> that would have taken all the fun out. Andrew and I were talking about this just yesterday in what forms we tend to see hornbeam take in Japanese trees, which is ironic since they mostly come from Korea. <laughs> but we tend to see, watch out, well, we tend to see trees with much longer sweeping trunks in Japan that actually aren't heavy and thick. They're long and slender without much taper, without many branches even, and close to zero scars. It's the white bark and the crenulations in that. That's the form we most commonly see in Japan, typically. And so it's nice to see something that's not the volcano-shaped or Mount Fuji-shaped 
a Mount Rainier shaped, whatever it happens to be, hood around here, tree. And so what I think of for this is you've got a lot of trunk and a lot of nice subtle direction in that. And by making it just a little bit taller, you get to use all of that bark that is unscarred that's already there. So you build from there. I'm hesitating to walk in front of the machine. And so maybe just finish out the run that has started up on the top would be your basic frame. So your height could be pretty big. And then you just start filling in from there. And then it's a matter of, do you want to fill in in the middle, in which case in something like an approach graft would be an option to start filling in on the side. Otherwise, you can kind of build up from here, build up from there. Um, something else, Andrew texted me once several months ago. This is a very personal detail I'm revealing. He said, is it just me or do horn beams want to be bonsai? <laughs> it, both in that case, but it is, they do want to be bonsai almost easier than any other species. They just grow, they just ramify, they just divide. And so if you are new to deciduous species and want to gimme, start with a horn beam. But in terms of the basic structure, I kind of like that you have a small number of branches and you're really lucky in that they all have similar angles. They all start up. We can style our deciduous trees with descending branches. If we want them to look like bonsai, we can have them look like actual trees in nature where they kind of meander up and out. You have set branch angles already that are fairly consistent. That's setting the pattern. If you like that pattern, it's a great place from which to build as you go out from there. Do you have any technical questions about growing these? Have you done much with hornbeam in the past? Uh, I have a few, but this is my most developed one, so not really. Yeah. One detail about if you ever get into defoliating, hornbeam tend to respond better to partial defoliation than full defoliation. It's stressful to take off all of the leaves. You can get a strong budding response, usually at the expense of all of the weak branches on the tree, especially the weak and interior branches on the tree. But it can be a good technique for balancing. The next step will be to decide how thick you want those branches to be. And I would guess the lower one here could be significantly thicker because the, branch, the trunk is still thick, way, way up high. And by growing a little bit taller, a point most eloquently made in a recent book called Bonsai Heresy, where a lot of awkwardnesses <laughs> can be escaped by simply growing the tree to the next size up. I use that all the time, and I do credit you usually. So it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good point. I just wanted to make a, a, a quick uh, reiteration of what, what Jonas said. With, with so few branches, if you grow it a little bit taller, you're not going to see it as a tree with so few branches <laughs> because you're going you're to be adding some branches and then it'll, it'll kind of make sense. Um, this, uh, uh, in the background here, Andrew and I were joking, this looks like another nurse log from this front off of this corner here. Andrew's turning it around to, the, to your front there. Kind of looks like a, a, a stump where something grew on the top of it and grew down kind of ficus-like. Um, uh, or Well, it's a very northwesty kind of feeling. <laughs> also, uh, you get a really wide base from that front. Oh, it looks like there's a wire in there. Yeah, somebody was thinking along these lines. Um, and, the, and then uh, the, uh, it looks like it could possibly fit in a, in a pot. <laughs> from that. Some of these really old, old roots are a little tricky. Oh, um, not necessarily. Yeah, especially with that, uh, with the angle, it could it could work. All those low branches have to be kind of let run for a little bit because they're so skinny. It could, Scott. The top was cut uh, really close. And so we have a great big scar with dried out dead wood up at the top. Ah. How do we deal with that? Hide it, hide it, hide it. <laughs> <laughs> um, tricky. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's tricky. You often get a little dieback with a, with a cut like that. It, it looks good sort of in the moment, but the problem is that you're, you're getting a little dieback and you're not getting the the wound creation that you want. And horn beams are not our best friends regarding wound closure. Uh, they're nothing like a maple, so we really have to stimulate them. We have to encourage them. Uh, from uh, the front that we were looking at uh, over here, um, you, 
you, you don't see that scar very much, therefore it doesn't exist. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's, <laughs> you're making a great point. It, it, is, it is a really big problem. And I, I would say be extra careful with horn beams when you're bringing them out of the ground. Uh, make your stubs longer, give yourself more to work with. Just one quick thing about the large scar up there, since it inevitably uh, will have a hard time healing because it's a huge scar and maybe horn beams, they don't heal as well as other species probably either, like compared to a trident maple, for example. So the only way around that to, to help that wound heal, I would think that I can think of would be a concrete, filling it with concrete, redoing the sides of the wound, scarring them again, clean cut, taking more old wood, soft wood out of the middle to, to allow it to, to roll in a little easier and before you once you do that then you can fill it with some epoxy or you know layer of concrete otherwise the big wound if it doesn't if it takes a long time to heal or just doesn't then that will just uh rot out over time and you'll end up with a hollow trunk eventually which is not not something we want on a like we don't want a hollow trunk unless we're really trying to go for that uh, make a hollow for some kind of feature so it's and for the longevity of the tree it'll be better with uh, just a healed wound so I've seen that done on a lot of different trees. I know it, it can really, uh, otherwise it'll, they just won't heal as well if they're really ha having a hard time healing already. Yeah, question. Yeah, question is, if we took this tree in the Anderson flat, because we have a wound, if we go the route of closing it, uh, should we put it back in the ground to assist in closing it? Yes, that would help with closing the wound more, um, but it would hurt <laughs> in developing the, the tree more. Um, you know, I see this as a very unusual tree. I, I don't think this is going to be ever a very classical traditional bonsai because we got so much gnarly uh, this at the base. And so I think having a little bit of deadwood on this tree for this piece of material isn't the worst idea. I think it can make sense. It's, you know, we have an unusual base, so let's put some unusual deadwood on a deciduous plant. Um, I wanted to go back to this low branch a bit. Um, we have, I think, a tendency of thinking of everything that comes off the trunk on a deciduous plant as being a branch. And when you look out at all the deciduous trees around us, most of what comes off the trunk are other trunks. Uh, and so if you have a bunch of negative space on here, you know, we have, you know, not very much going on in this area of the plant. This could almost be grown up and trained as a secondary trunk line to fill this space. And that would look very natural. I mean, the tree has, you know, if you're hiking in the woods, you see trees growing on a hillside where there's erosion, you're going to see something like this. So I think this, this plant lends itself to a more organic, a natural kind of styling. Having a little bit of deadwood is fine. It shows the trauma of what happened down at the base. Uh, and then you can fill a lot of the negative space if you want to uh, with secondary trunk lines. Most deciduous trees, oaks are famous for this. The trunk will come up about 10% of the trunk line, then it fractures into five or six or seven trunks. Uh, and so some, this, this doesn't need to have that many, but having these branches be so strong and upright and serve more as trunks would, would fill a lot of this space. Um, how many years so Mike brings it to the show? Um, probably, you know, this has so much momentum going to it. Uh, if you fertilize it a little bit more, build out some, you know, if, if we go the, the route that I suggested, build out some of these as secondary kind of trunk line. Seven to 10 years, if you're, if you're kind of putting it on a good trajectory. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I think, I think it's, uh, it's not going to be your traditional horn beam that you see every day, but I think that's kind of what makes it fun. Yeah, question. That's right. Yeah, how you manage that. Um, you know, in bonsai, we can only do three things. Uh, we can, um, one, we can do nothing. And when we do nothing, if I do nothing on this branch down here, uh, and I'm kind of stealing this from Jonas, but if I do nothing, I, I, I let this grow, that's gonna thicken this up. If I prune this, that's gonna keep it smaller. So just by letting this grow, cutting this back, doing that for five years, getting a really simple trajectory uh, or a simple plan, but doing that consistently for five years is where you see progress on deciduous. Um, so by letting this grow more, uh, by cutting this back more, eventually this is going to get thicker. Um, so we can do nothing, uh, and that would thicken this up. Uh, we can 
shape growth. So once we let this grow, we do nothing, we can edit how it goes. That's putting a wire on it, that's um, bending it with a guy wire, things of that nature. Uh, or we can remove growth, which is pruning, which is what we talked about for up here. Um, so uh, yeah, I would, I think this does need to be substantially thicker, but by really letting it grow by you probably doing some wiring to save some length uh, that you get every time to develop some, some more trunk lines, I think you you get there pretty pretty fast. Yeah, let's move on to another tree. All right. All right. Natural light. There we go. All right. Looks like a white pine from Telperion. Uh, who's who's this? This is Brandon's, right? Uh, Brandon Myron, he's, he's back on the phone. But uh, so I know this is a Japanese white pine from Telperion Farms. Um, and I'm going to pass it along to, to a good white pine person. Start it up. I'll start it out since I chose I chose it to be next. It looks familiar for some reason. I think I might have might have had this at one point even, but uh, I was just uh, automati automatically kind of like the pot it's in just for the the style of tree it is more of a kind of an elegant boonjean feel. Thinner thinner trunk with good taper and some pretty good lower branching. I was kind of looking at the the front how it's facing me here. We get. Get a nice white nabari, good surface root spread, just starting to bark up, and then we've got a, a few options for, for lower branching, which uh, we'd have to probably uh, decide what to use there. Got, got a, maybe one or two too many in there, and a couple of these do kind of almost come from the inner curve, but not really. You wouldn't want that if they did, so it's, it's good that they don't, if you can kind of see that, how they're coming out of there. So I kind of like how that... <clears throat> You know, it's one of those cases where even though it's a conifer, like we could treat a branch like this as a as more of a trunk if we wanted to, even though it comes up at a at a comes up at an upward angle. I like it because it follows the kind of the main trunk line or you could you could bend it over more to kind of get it to harmonize with that. And that might be more interesting to me than than just dropping one of these low branches down, which some of which will probably just be too low by the time you bring them down anymore. So. If, something, if we leave something like this and call the front facing me, if we leave this as a back branch, we'd want to cut it back and, and go with this for the future. So obviously a lot of branches are still too leggy, and then that's what I'm seeing down low. And uh, then you move on up to the top. We don't have, have many options for branching when you get up to the top of the tree, just a bunch of different tops. So if one, you know, a few too many, and again, we just have to choose choose the one that has the best taper and the best trunk line and uh, choose which direction we want it to go in. So I'm kind of seeing it, if we're, if we're using this, this is the main branch and going with it as a, a right flow, then I would probably want to lose, lose something like this and, and make it a shorter tree and keep the focus down, you know, down towards the lower part of the trunk where there's more interest. And then we've talked about scars, so the, that one, the main obvious one, will have to be dealt with first probably, just cutting that down and getting that to heal over first, or maybe even we might even have to combine that, that with uh, this branch connected to it to really get a nice taper in the future after we make that wound, but we still might not do both of those at once. We might do the big one first out of the center and then finish that off later. You don't have to do it all at once, so... That's kind of what I'm seeing in it, uh, just roughly. So if anybody wants to elaborate on that or see something else in it, please do. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, a tree that has a very natural taper. Um, if, it, if it did grow in the ground, it didn't grow in the ground for very long. It had, had a long <laughs> extension here. It could have been in a bag. Um, and because of that, we have the potential for this tree to develop future taper through the branches themselves, not using them as sacrifices. So the idea of sacrifices might actually be over. You can you can work with this idea with Japanese white pine. You can work with this idea with um, any kind of natural taper tree or very frequently uh, applied uh, idea to something like a Japanese maple, for instance. Um, so there was is, is only one taper cut here, right here. 
Uh, and that might be about it. So as Matt was saying, you take that out and then you have four options <laughs> of what you want to do. Uh, this is a fairly natural lead right here. Uh, you could use some of these others, but you might want to might want to use this stub as a way to bend them up, leave that on there for a little bit longer, and begin to take away some of the others because this is uh, this is a bit of a whorl up there. This has a really nice uh, really nice structure, good good bones, nice nabari. Uh, this is a rare tree. If uh, Brandon doesn't keep his wits about him, somebody might run off with this. Japanese white pine is a very unusual plant in the United States. We don't really see this very often. People don't take the time to grow it. Bravo for having it, for growing it. <laughs> it's very nice. Anybody else want to come in? Question for you, Mike. Yep. Yeah. Huh? Strategy there. You, you cut yeah. that stuff, and then you've got four oh. branches to choose from. Right. Give us a timeline for mm -hmm. executing or making selections. Here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be fairly rapid uh, in terms of when you cut, I wouldn't cut more than one a year, but they're fairly small still. So you can cut them pretty rapidly. Uh, one one, uh, one tip uh, here, we have uh, this, I don't know if you guys can make this out. Uh, the extension that was cut off is about an inch and a half. This here is about three quarters of an inch. Uh, and that's even a little less than that. So uh, what I recommend is if you're cutting back to this one, it should be at least twice, uh, excuse me, at least half, maybe even a little more than half the diameter of the, of the stub that you're cutting back to. That, that way you get a pretty good flow. If you, if you cut back to something smaller than that, you get into the problem like uh, what Andrew was talking about, where you're cutting back to a tiny little shoot. Then you lose a year of momentum in your tree. Uh, but to answer your question, I, I think in about three years, you could probably remove the major problems here um, and begin to whittle back this as well. The major problems meaning some of these extra uh, thing, uh, things that are <laughs> are potential uh, uh, leaders. What you could do to get yourself there faster is to cut off like what, what Matt was talking about, begin to trim uh, some of these back. If you've identified the one you want, there's no reason to cut it all the way back to here in one day. You can begin to, to cut half of the foliage off in the areas that exactly. you don't want, leave them on. Let this one extend. You could even put a wire on that, for instance, but let that one run. And within a year, it'll have gotten the message. I just thought of one other way to, to treat that area there, if, if one wanted to, was instead of thinking about it in terms of cut and wound healing, uh, we could just make that, that stub into an apical gin. Uh, and you can, uh, since it's a young trunk and there's, there's not a lot of bark on it yet, up in that upper portion, just to add some age, another way of doing it sometimes is just making that starting out with that short gin tapering it down and you know making it look rough and weathered and then carrying it down into the trunk a little bit eventually to and that's another kind of way of like visually improving the the taper on an area like that which is already clustered so just one other way to to go about it perhaps they uh they let me pick again so another deciduous um Who's who's own is this? This From is the mine. Road. All right. You want to come up and tell us about it? You know, it's kind of a pain to get there from here, but All right. I'll yell it out. You, you can project. <laughs> um, cork bark, uh, ch uh, Chinese elm, uh, purchased from Bonsai Northwest about four years ago. Field grown by John Muth. Um, potted into that pot last year, or two years ago, I can't remember. And uh, there's a forward-facing, straight-at-you root that um, I partially cut in order to uh, remove it in the coming year. Yeah, fun. So, Chinese elm from Bonsai Northwest. John. Sure. Okay, okay, I'll talk this one. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so the just pointing out your root thing, I think that's a good idea. If you've got a big root, to take it off in stages, and especially if you've got... Because uh, we talked about the lifeline sometimes dying off uh, part of the part of the trunk, so I think it's a good idea to give the tree the message that this is going away and it'll disperse its energy other places. So that's a good idea. Um, you've also probably noticed on the elms they don't heal very nicely, so they've got they they tend to die back from the cut. So I think uh, really important to cut, leave a stub, let it let it. Uh, uh, 
re reassess its energy again, and then you can go back in and clean that up. Uh, but it's a real issue with uh, especially this kind of elm. Uh, yeah, the other thing I, I think with these is they, um, they tend to, they tend to get these burls with a ton of, uh, a ton of sh shoots out of them. So you have to be careful with that to like keep that under control so that, so that you don't get these weird reverse tapers up higher in the trunk. You see that a lot of times with elms, um, especially field grown elms. What'll happen is this exactly right here. Um, they'll make a cut. We get no less than 400 shoots coming out of that cut. And uh, so then we have massive reverse tapers up there. And so this is a good, if your intention is to save this part that you cut, it's a good idea to fairly soon come in here and reduce that down to two or three so that you don't get these burls way up high in the trunk, especially like at the ends of branches. So if you're making these cuts on the tr trunk and you're planning on keeping that, you're not planning on cutting it back further, Go back in and clean that up, especially sooner on an elm, so that they don't end up doing that. I think this, I think this needs to be addressed at some point, just for visual. I'm not sure exactly what you would do to that big trunk, um, but I think that's something else that you would want to consider playing with that thing somehow. I like the triple kind of big chunky triple chunk trunk. Kind of the sumo is nice look at it from in here you don't really don't see, need that. To see that I mean, it doesn't help you get it into the right pot necessarily but <laughs> yeah yeah so if you if depending on the front the front yeah. yeah depending on what the front is this isn't as much of a thing you know it's it's much more obvious in this orientation but you can uh, you can sometimes hide some of those flaws in different orientations you could also potentially bury it change angle Another idea uh, to prevent the 400 shoot problem uh, that uh, John was talking about is to make two cuts. So you make a cut and you're expecting a thousand shoots and then actually what you, where you really want to cut is two or three inches lower than that where you're going to have just a few coming out. Then you cut it back to there um, six months down the line or something and you won't have the same response. So when I see a tree like this, the first thing that comes to mind uh, Brings up the a homework assignment for you all tonight. Earlier, Andrew mentioned a name, Maria Hajik. Um, how many of you are familiar with her work? You don't have to do the homework. Everyone else does have to do the homework, and we have you on camera for this. <laughs> the long-term progressions that she has shared have shown what you can do when you start with a wild, multi-trunk base that doesn't necessarily make sense and doesn't invite an obvious interpretation. When you look at her finish point, what you realize is she has built the trees over long periods of time. So, how many of you have done archery or are secretly sharpshooters? You know what a target looks like. You've got the bullseye, you've got some red, yellow, blue, or white if you're missing the whole target like me. If you think of the heart of the tree as the bullseye, you're building out one ring at a time. At some level, that's what's happening, in that you have the core, the bullseye is the heart of the trunk. You're next going to be focusing on the next either trunk extensions or base of those primary branches. Your focus will go outward from there and outward from there, and the branches are going to get thinner and more distributed as they go. Mario's work is the best example I think I know of that has a starting point that's similar to that. But if you build the tree outward or think about it that way, that can be a useful metaphor for figuring out how we get from A to Z. Well, one of the things about where she lives like a Mediterranean climate, right? Yes. She has a much stronger growing season than what we have here. If you follow some of the same strategy. So, so, she, so her, she's able to multiply those seasons out. So what Scott's pointing out is very rightly that her weather is not Portland. <laughs> it's not close to Portland. And that it, it might take a very different set of cycles to get the exact same results. I would follow the same approach, and I will say there are many different recipes that we could actually get to the same end result. And Andrew and I have talked about this every other tree we look at in his garden. Is We were recently at Peter T's garden. Michael mentioned Peter T. He's an artist in Auburn, California. Again, with very different weather than Portland, very different weather than what Mari has. It'll be 105 for two weeks at a time in summer, and then it'll drop down to 103. Whereas... <laughs> Whereas, uh, you know, I don't have any of that weather at all. And so 
One way to work with deciduous material like this is if it needs to get thicker, you let it run and it just runs and runs and runs until it, a neighbor prunes it over the fence or it has a desired thickness. And if it has a desired thickness, you can shorten it very short and then you repeat the process until you've built out the core of those primary branches. The top of the tree on the meantime, you're pinching, pruning, pinching, pruning and keeping it within silhouette and you're actually building it out, again, from the bullseye to the yellow zone to the blue to the black to the white. That is one option and it's guaranteed to work and it's guaranteed your tree will look really silly the entire process and it'll take up a lot of space on the bench. It's likely going to be in a wood box if you're doing that. The alternative is, and this is just for the whole other end of the spectrum, you're going to put it in a bonsai pot, you're going to keep more of a full mature silhouette and you're going to do some letting running of longer shoots, but you're going to cut them back before they cause trouble with the neighbors, you're going to cut them back a little more frequently, maybe once every one to two years instead of once every four to five years, and you're going to let the taller branches uh, fill in. You can get to the same point, but it's a different way of building it, and if you're on the fence about deciding what you want to end up with, if your focus is precise inner nodes and long-term super high quality, you might want to focus on making sure your inner nodes are small. That's relevant on a Japanese maple, you get it for free with a seiju elm. If you want the tree to look good the entire way, then you can follow it in a bonsai pot right away, give it that silhouette, and follow what they were saying about your next repotting steps, which will focus on deciding if you're going to roll with the big roots or if you're going to hide and or minimize over time. What's next? What was that name again? Maria? Yeah, Maria, uh, M-A-R-J-A, possibly. Uh, I-J-A. I-J-A, I -J -A, yeah, M-A-R-I-J-A. H-A-D-G-I-C, is it? Hajik? Close. Or J-I-C, somewhere in there. Yeah. I can't spell in English, let alone the rest, and my last name is proof of that. Oh, that's right, she's a recent presenter, so check the BSOP video page for that. Whose is this? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> Gail Jones? Oh, okay, great. Do you have any Do you have any questions for us about this before Matt? Only just since I know this tree, since I've been working on some of these that Gail and Salem has been growing in the ground herself for over a decade, I think, and I've been kind of helping her along the way, you know, trying to get some some of these already had the trunks they did when I started on them in the ground, so we've been making cuts where they've gotten way too crazy on top and trying to. You can see how much advantageous stuff has probably just popped off the old bark in the trunk just from that being in the ground and doing that you know probably more likely still in the ground for that to happen of course but i would still expect some now that these have been in here for a couple of years and just getting established uh the color on some of them a little maybe a little dull from the the winter cold they, they sit outside all winter at her place and it usually doesn't get that cold but they're on the ground the whole time and and uh judging by the buds the candles it has this year it's doing pretty well and, and i think they all are but so I kind of know this, you know, and there's the backstory for you, and the new owner, let's, uh, do you have any specific questions about it so far, or just, um, no, I didn't really you just got it, so you haven't here. studied it all, yeah. <laughs> not a whole lot yet, but, so I've, I've looked at it before, this is kind of an easy one for me just to, to jump into, it, kinda, it actually does kind of right, remind me of the, the hornbeam we just talked about over there, sty style-wise, even though it's a conifer, uh, you just have, have less branching, and a tall top, and, <laughs> Uh, not as much of a top. You, you got some some good future branches near the top going on though. That'll be real helpful, uh, especially if you wanted to leave it as a taller that a tree. Cut? What's is that? that? A wedge cut in there? Uh, she asked me if there's a wedge cut going on in there, and I don't think so. It may look like it could have been one in the past, but I've never never tried one on any of those trees yet. I've I've done some on pine though, and they can handle it pretty well uh, during the fall. I guess is when I would try something like that. Uh, so you do that on a Something like this, if you're trying to to correct that angle and use that as a branch, uh, I don't, I wouldn't want to. I don't. What I don't like about this as a branch is just obviously how how thick and straight it is, and with no taper yet. So, it's one that that I would start by probably doing a little notch on the underside here, not all the way where it comes off of the trunk. On, like you want to do it on the bottom. If you're gonna bring the branch down, you got to do that that notch cut on the bottom, just with a thin saw. You're going in about a third of the way on the underside of this branch and that'll allow it to have more flex so it won't 
crack or you know break or anything like that on the top if you do that it has some flexibility but not enough so that would be that's where I would start on this and then you know doing a little more cut back and if if nothing happens you and you wanted to use that as a branch and nothing pops you're just gonna have to put a scion on there that's just one of those cases where you either get rid of it or you hang on to it with hopes of doing that next spring if it doesn't if you don't want to waste a lot of time doing all the stuff I just talked about it well don't bother just you know if we're gonna keep that as a branch Try a silent. You got nothing to lose at this point. It doesn't doesn't need to be repotted anytime soon. So that's. Uh, but uh, the gist of my story is I kind of like it as a taller tree, more kind of a taller, more elegant tree. So I'd probably still try to choose a front where there's a nice nice wide base, and there's still some some minor crossing roots here that are pretty easy to to fix later. And uh, there's some scars on this side which will still need to be whittled down some more in the future to, to get that taper a little nicer, and then probably something like this, a uh, really thick, already kind of long branch, you'd probably just want to cut that off and go with something something like that. If we're going to need a branch there, then there's there's better options for the future. So Go ahead, Andrea. I haven't, haven't covered it all yet. All right. Well, I don't have solutions, but I have questions. Um, and they're questions for you guys. Uh, so... We don't have a lot of branching on this side of the tree. Um, what are two methods that we can use to, to get branching there? If we want, let's assume that we want branching there. I'm not saying that we need it there, but let's assume that we want branching here. Grafting. Grafting, yeah. Grafting, it's easy. You, you put a branch where you need it. It's, it's really simple. There's lots of different methods depending on the species and, and the way you want to do it. But yeah, you can put a branch where you want it. Um, what's another way to get a branch right here? Approach graft. Approach graft, yeah, different types of grafts can get us there. What else? How else do we get a branch to magically show up over here? Bending another branch. Fairies. What was that? Bending another branch. Bending, yeah. Um, a lot of times with Yamadori, um, especially some of the old Azo spruce in Japan, they have these wonderful trunks. All the branching comes off the trunk and they bend it down. They bend all the branching. Maybe there's five branches that come from the top of the trunk. You bend it down and you, you're able to place it. Where you need it. We have to do that on Yamadori a lot of the time, but those same solutions can work on field grown. So let's say you have some a branch up here. This something like this could come down and fill that space. That might not be the best way, especially with a young tree where we, we're still going to be investing a lot of time. But it's a creative option if, if you if you have big gaps to fill. Well, I mean, to Andrew's point, like that's a good point. There's definitely too much negative space. If you wanted to use it as a taller tree, that's why it's good. It's got all these these new branches starting to develop, even if they're coming more from the top of the tree. So what he's saying, you know, you could drop that down and fill in the space, or you could let these grow out and have that drop down as a side branch and fill in that space. And then maybe that would allow you to be more selective up here to, and you know, the top, the top still probably needs to be shortened also. So I'd want to go to get better taper in the future. I'd probably take it down another notch or maybe, yeah, probably at least starting taking that big knob off the top here. That's just a couple old, Sacrifice wounds kind of combined just left as a big stub. So there's there's plenty to you know cut make you can make a new top pretty easily because they're coming out at nice angles to be a top and then it'll, it'll still leave you with some of these uh, branches to develop to kind of fill in all that negative space because a little easier to do down here with what we got. So yeah. What does John think? <laughs> uh, I was just looking at the we were talking about um, sacrificial branches. And I was just looking at these lower branches, um, and not that we would necessarily want to grow these branches much larger for the style and shape of the tree, but if you look at this tree a lot closer, this tree was grown really nicely in that there are a lot of buds and alive branches really nice and close. So if you were, because a lot of times with field grown material, a lot of this inner growth will die, and then you end up with tufts of, of foliage way out. And so this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. We have... We have buds in here super close. And so we may, if we wanted to grow this this part of the trunk, I mean branch larger, we may let this part grow out, 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 and then we'll eventually cut back into these really nice ones. If this tree is thin enough where we don't have to worry too much about uh, this being shaded out, but we might need to also defoliate, partially defoliate some of the stuff around it so that it keeps this strong. Or you might want to pull off needles and weaken this so that it doesn't abandon that part. But this this has some nice visual examples of 
some budding that is happening in here and we can encourage that. Before we lose our needles, we want to encourage that to bud. The other way, obviously, is to graft in there because in this, even in this design, this is too far away. Now I can see that this was decandled and it looks like that decandling is probably what pushed some of this budding all through here. You can't really see it from where you are, but there's almost every one of these needles has a needle bud popping out, same thing over here. And so by decandling it, we've reintroduced energy back. Instead of it just forcing the energy out, we're giving energy back in. So this is something that's like if you're growing trees in the ground or you're growing trees hard, rather than figuring out how to graft pines because it's kind of a pain, you can, you can work yourself into having branches there. So eventually when you cut this off, you've got a nice branch there to work with. John, do you... So if you're going to leave that sacrifice run, do you do, do you candle those inside ones in May now? Uh, so, yeah, you could, once these get larger, and then they're kind of becoming uh, too big for what they're what you want them to be, which is a nice compact pad that's sitting right here, you'll begin to decandle these inner ones and turning them into nice branching. And then when this is the right thickness, then you can go off with that. Uh, you know, this this is probably the better example here. So this this has a nice branch you're eventually gonna come off with all of this and build your pad off of there's one bud there, one bud there, one bud there. So you've got three buds there to build your pad off of. You let this go, and then you're building your pad off of these three that are coming off of the base of that branch. Yeah, so you're gonna begin decandling and really slowing this down, because you can tell this one is already almost out of control. If we want our pad to right here, this one is already almost gone. So maybe next year we're already gonna be, we already are gonna decandle this or weaken this candle somehow so that we can keep a nice tight uh, Mark? Hey, can you uh, explain the mechanism, how it backbuds when you decandle? Why that happens? I mean, it's just not random. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason it happens. It's magic. Uh, I think it's just, I think it's oxen and energy. I mean, other people could probably speak to that better, but I think it's it's that the train is running this way really hard, and by, by taking away that drive it's got to push that energy out somewhere and so it tends to push it out you're easiest to push it out through a, a needle it'll push a bud through the needle for pines but it might also just push it out through some kind of little node an old needle scar so it has to push a bud before it can grow a needle yes yeah grow a needle before yeah so it'll have an, a needle and then out of the old needle it'll grow a bud if there's still a needle there and then if once the needle falls off it sometimes can push a bud out of that old needle scar that help at all? Uh, we're going to move on to our, I think, our last tree. Uh, I just wanted to make one point, uh, which is uh, just in terms of uh, foliage mass, this is about bare minimum. That This is a, a really strong species, Japanese black pine, for just about everything. You don't want to go less than this because then it doesn't have enough energy to, to, to power the furnace, so to speak. I agree with that point. Other than, I mean, because this is a more boonjean like tree, we don't want as much foliage either. But for other trees, I'd agree with Michael. All right. We're going to finish with this uh, crab apple, which is going to preview uh, more table uh, talk for tomorrow. But Scott, tell us about your, your field grown tree. Uh, this is an Indian magic crab apple grown by uh, Randy Knight, and I probably dug it up out of his field uh, 15 years ago. Then it probably spent another five years in the ground at my house, uh, growing it up more, uh, growing a top, doing all kinds of different things. And in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been trying to refine it. Uh, you might be able to find some scraps of blossoms on it, nice magenta color blossoms. And uh, I have struggled with it a little bit over the last 10 years uh, with some disease. It might have been um, Phytophthora or something like that, but uh, vascular disease. But it's, it's uh, going now. But I've, I uh, defoliated or partially defoliated uh, for the past several years, been pruning it every year for the last 10 years. And uh, I may have been a little late some years, so it doesn't push out as strongly as I'd like and trying to get the uh, bottom uh, branches to develop more. I'm trying to create a bigger, broader canopy, uh, rounder kind of canopy that I it was what I picture in an apple tree and um, really fight uh, basil shoots on this guy. 
you can see where there have been some sacrifice branches that have grown here to try and thicken up the base, but I'm pretty much keeping all of those eliminated now because they just make too many scars. And uh, I, my plan was maybe today when we're working is I may prune and partially defoliate um, the top and then leave all of these branches uh, down here to thicken and grow to get, you, you'll see a big disparity between the inch or so thickness when it comes off of the trunk here and then it quickly converts to a quarter inch. So trying to build that up even and you'll see one of my little tricks when if you're wondering what the uh, uh, zip tie is up there, the little my little color coding is to say let this branch grow. Blue is let it grow, yellow is or red is to cut it. <laughs> hey, Scott. Quick question. Yeah. yeah. At one point, I heard you in a presentation talk about you prefer to pot, uh, to position the tree in the center of the pot. So the question is about positioning a tree in the center of the pot. Right. Is there, why, why do you do that? That's a good question. <laughs> so, well, you'd have to have a good reason to not put it in the center, is what I would say. So, um, if I stand like this, my balance, I haven't moved my, I haven't moved my foot. Sorry if you can't see me on screen. I haven't moved my foot at all. I'm moving my arms and I'm still in balance. So the balance is here at the base. And so if I'm cantilevering the tree out over the edge of the pot, I still want to have the balance created at the base where it's stable. And that's, so if a root issue, especially on a collected tree, prevents me from getting it to the center of the pot, then, well, I have to deal with that. But if I can, ideally, I'm always going to get a tree in the center of the pot and then let it... I actually emphasize the movement of the trunk more by having the tree centered in the pot than if I was to offset it. Now, that doesn't mean that on a tree this size that I might not move it a half an inch to one side, but that's about all I'm talking about, just so you barely see the difference. What's really hard about a tree like this with a critique, these guys are have a hard time. Are you guys seeing is that there's so much foliage you can't see what's going on in the branches. But. <laughs> Part of that has to do with the directionality, I think. You know, yeah. depending on the flow of the tree, like this one's more upright. It doesn't have too much directionality. So like Scott was saying, he's offsetting it one way or the other intentionally to compensate for that, the direction the trunk is heading in and still uh, just have it, have it, has it end up a little more balanced if you do it that way. So it's... Yeah, beautiful tree. Thanks, Scott, for bringing it. Um, you know, Scott made a point. He's still trying to thicken up some lower branching, but I think uh, I encourage everybody to come up and take a good look at this because this is a good example of someone who's taken a piece of field-grown material and spent some time to thicken up some primary branching. We talked about that a lot this afternoon, and this tree has good momentum doing that. Uh, Scott's saying he wants to maybe do a little bit more on some of the lower branching, and I think that's a great idea, but it's, it's a good testament to see some of the power that's in the trunk he's, he's built into the primary branching over the other years. Uh, it's also a good point on this tree that, you know, you can't see too much of it right now, uh, and that's a good thing because we, des uh, we design deciduous trees uh, to have uh, dense, full ramification. And uh, if we saw a lot of the trunk and we saw a lot of... Um, the, the, the detail of, of the structure this time of year, that means it's going to be a very thin tree when all the leaves drop. And so having branches like this that come towards you, we talked about on a conifer, yeah, that's maybe, we, we don't want that too far down below, but conifers don't drop their, their needles. Deciduous trees drop their leaves. And so having a lot of branches more in the front coming right at you is a good thing because it's giving us that, that it's adding and contributing to that, that density that we get in, in, in wintertime. Uh, it's a beautiful tree. I really like the pot pairing too. The red redness of the leaves tends to match and, and blend pretty well. So it's, it's a good tree to study. Thanks for, for bringing it. Scott, are you thinking about bringing it a lot wider on lower to have it be a much broader silhouette? Uh, yeah, I'd like it to be broader in the lower. I think that'd be really, really cool. Yeah. A lot of people design upright trees because the trunks happen too already be upright and some of the most impressive trees take really really broad forms and we just haven't seen a lot of that in North America yet whereas in Japan you're as likely to see a really wide tree as you are to see a tall tree. One of the, I didn't make really 
clear. So yeah. what's happened is when I pruned it back uh, each year, it has not responded. That's very right. Well. It hasn't pushed out brand new shoots like a trident maple or something. It's been very sparse. And so that's why when I partially defoliate it this year, I'll only do the crown let the bottom run. And so Scott's saying he does not get the response he looks for after his mid-season pruning, which would start happening right now, probably now through the next month or two. One way to get a tree broader is to do your pruning on the top twice a year and do your pruning on the bottom no more than once a year, or even more exaggerated, because you're allowing this to run a little bit more because you have active growth tips which will continue to elongate and thicken up. So you're kind of getting a twofer. You're getting a little more thickening and a little more elongating. You're still going to cut back to a little bit, but because you're leaving twice as much wood when you cut back, you preserve short inner nodes and you are increasing the odds you're going to get that budding response. If you're still not getting the response you want down low, it just means keeping the check, the top in check that much more. Because on these deciduous species, when you let the tops grow, it's really hard to get it down low. I've been growing some crab apple from a couple different types of crab apple from seed for the last six, seven, eight years, and I've noticed the exact same thing. They want to grow taller, all of the investment is going to be up here, and if you want broader, it, it's slower, which means you just have to be harder on the top to give those a little more oomph. So that would be one thing that comes to mind to try for getting that, because I would love to see the finished product, this will be spectacular. Any questions? I can't see anything behind the tree. I had a question. Um, regarding what you were just talking about, would um, putting in a larger pot help with that as well, while you're still trying to develop some of the lower branches? Give it more root mass? You know, it can, but I think this is actually an adequate size pot for that. At this stage of development, if you're not really building the trunk and you just want the branches to thicken, you can do that in either an appropriately sized bonsai pot or maybe an only slightly extra large bonsai right. pot. Right. Yeah. Yes? So you talked about letting the branches grow out the farther they grow out and cut them back and the branch out more. Is it equally important to have all the foliage on the branch all the way up to the trunk or? Does it help to thin some of those leaves on the inside out a little bit and let it continue to grow? That's a really good question. Is it important when you're letting the branches grow long, whether or not you leave leaves along the way or whether you strip some of those leaves? I have tried it different ways on different species and I don't have a clear answer for you. I know Bjorn has been a proponent of sometimes you leave the thing long but you strip it but you keep the leaves at the tip or sometimes you strip all the leaves but you leave it long or sometimes you cut it but you leave the leaves that are there. I have not done it enough to tell you with confidence on this species which pattern is going to be the rest, which is why I would love to be able to say, well, Scott, you should have grown 12 of these and then you could have experimented. <laughs> but we tried to do those experiments much earlier in the process and that's when you lean on people that have done it before and have the most educated guesses possible for that. I could tell you specifically what I've seen having done this on crab apple and ume where I have tried stripping them. I find that whenever you're stripping all the leaves, it really slows things down, and if your goal isn't putting the brakes on, then there's not a big benefit to pulling the leaves off, and that it's more a matter of what's more convenient for how much time you're spending with the tree, whereas keeping the top small, letting these run a little bit better is a very simple way to do that. May I add one thing? Oh, if you're trying to just let light into the tree, some of those uh, leaves on the interior you're asking about, you can just cut them in half with a little bit of light in, and it probably wouldn't weaken the tree either. Another uh, thing you could do is if, if you wanted to restrain this and thicken this, we talked about maybe cutting this once a year, or cutting this twice a year, cutting this once a year. Another trajectory like that that you could em employ is pinching this. So when this leaves out in the spring, you know, this little growth, when it's soft and fleshy, I assume you're going to be cutting this, so can I demo a pinch? Um, you take this when it's soft and fleshy, you let it grow out about two leaves. This is an alternate leaf plant. So on any alternate leaf plants where we don't have pairs of buds, we have buds that alternate along the stem, uh, you never cut back to one because if you always cut back to one, you're going to get movement uh, because you'll get new directions. You'll get taper because you're cutting it back, but you don't get any ramification. It's where you had one branch, you get one in its place. So on any alternate leaf plant, whether we're pinching or trimming, we always cut either two or three depending on which direction you want it to go. But if we were pinching this, uh, what you could do in the spring when it's first breaking bud is you could pinch that, that new growth just on the top, maybe one third of the tree. That will really keep this nice and tight and that might even accelerate the, the thickening that, that you'll get from the elongation on the bottom. Uh, Scott, question. How long is this out of Randy's field? What's what's the timeline here? I was thinking it was 2002 when we had a convention or something, but something like that. Yeah. Um, 
something around there. 2002. Two or was it, or seven. Two thousand seven. Very fun. A good fifteen years. It's been a while. Yeah, a good fifteen years. And we're still making subtle improvements. So bonsai's bonsai's not about the end, it's about the process and that's that's beautiful. Question. Yeah, can you manipulate the energy by, you know, maybe pulling all the blossoms off of one part of the tree? Yeah. All the energy going back into the growth? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, here's, here's the interesting thing that our friend Gary Wood taught us is that if you look at a flower when it's forming or a fruit even after it's flowered when it's, the fruit is forming, what color is it when it's growing? Green. It's green, which means there's chlorophyll there, which means it's generating at least some of its own energy. We don't know precisely what amount, but um, the biggest thing with fruiting or flowering is we don't take it off to, to um, change ener energy, but we can remove it to change focus. Um, uh, so oftentimes, uh, even on certain species, uh, by removing a fruit, then we encourage more tip growth. Uh, so the tree hormonally mm -hmm. determines what it wants to focus on. And if we remove all its fruit and flowers, um, then you know, it's not really robbing energy. It won't weaken the tree because they're genetically programmed to do that. But we can you know, program it to grow and, and, and we can edit that growth. Question? Might be a question for Scott, but after this came out of Randy's field, um, how many stages of root reduction did, did it take, and how dramatic were those root reductions? So the question was, how many root reductions did it have? It had, uh, as far as I remember, it had only one basic one. It's been growing in a, well, I put it into the ground first, so it had a root reduction then when I put it into the ground. And I did put, I probably, put a tile or something like that underneath it to help out, but it went straight into a bonsai pot. There's been no transition, no mica pots, no anything like that. All righty, well, that's gonna wrap up our super critique. Um, just a few things. Um, we forgot to wish everybody happy World Bonsai Day today. May 14th is World Bonsai Day, so it's fun that we're doing this together. Um, bonsai does make the world a better place. Um, and thanks everybody again for coming out. Here's how this afternoon is gonna work. We're gonna take a break for about a half an hour um, or maybe 20 minutes, something like that. Right around 3.30ish, uh, we'll come back and, and we'll do the group workshop. If you brought a tree up here for a critique that we didn't get to, uh, please bring that. Our, our guests are gonna float around and, and we, can, we can help you with that. If you brought some things to work on or, or to share some techniques on, on trees that you're gonna be doing, um, it's, it's a, a more casual kind of format, but all of our panel are here to walk around and help you. So we'll, we'll clear a few chairs out, we'll set up some tables, uh, and we will uh, get going. Tomorrow, we are in the Milwaukee Center, the actual building. Uh, and that's, you know, we're, we're transitioning from outside the farm to inside the table. So um, tomorrow we'll have a, a, a small display, which will be fun to see trees like this, which have been out of the field for, for a little bit of time. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll be doing uh, demos and, and some presentations. We'll get to use the screen and, and see a lot of fun photos. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, or tomorrow afternoon after lunch, uh, we will have um, another super critique of the, the trees from the exhibit, trees like this one that are a little further along. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with a reception. Um, our vendors will be back tomorrow. They'll be, be inside. So uh, we hope to every, see everybody this afternoon for the group workshop and tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, find me or, or someone else and we'll, we'll take care of it. But again, thanks. And we'll see you in about 20-ish, 20, 20, 20, 20, 30 minutes, something like that.